New Horizons has just discovered this, a four and a half billion year old virgin, pristine and untouched since the dawn of the solar system. Now just think about that for a second. This thing has sat here on the edge of the solar system where it's cold and dark, unchanged and immutable, while the Earth has done all of this. It's called Ultima Thule, which means the most extreme limit of travel and discovery. Oh, and boy, is that such an apt name on so many levels. New Horizons was the probe that hammered past Pluto a few years back. Now, visiting an object on the edge of the solar system is always a dilemma for a mission planner, because you've got to give it lots of speed to get out there quickly. But that also means that your flyby is quick, so it limits the amount of data you can get. So if you wanted a slow flyby, of course, that means you would have to fly out there slowly which means that the team that built it would probably be dead by the time it actually gets there. And of course, you can't pack enough fuel to stop when you get there because it would just make the spacecraft way too big. Because basically, all of the fuel that you see here was what was needed to accelerate this tiny little craft up to about 10 or so kilometers per second. And tiny is right. This thing only weighs about half a ton. And if you wanted to slow it down again, to say go into orbit around Pluto, you would need at least that much fuel again. So the New Horizons team settled for a fast launch. Indeed, it was the fastest launch ever. And even at that, it took about 10 years to get out to Pluto. It's so far out that when it transmits signals, they take over five hours to get back to Earth, traveling at the speed of light. Now, if you think that's impressive, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Because by the time you get out as far as Pluto, of course, the sun is a tiny little dot in the sky. In fact, thanks to the inverse squared law, by the time you get out as far as Pluto, the sun is less than one thousandth of the brightness that it is here on Earth, which of course would make solar panels almost pointless out this far in the solar system. In fact, <laughs> As a little side note, only a real bonehead would propose using solar panels, say, out as far as, I don't know, Saturn or something. <coughs> Elon Musk. So anyway, New Horizons went for the only viable option for power this far out. It's nuclear. It's got a thermoelectric nuclear generator on it. Basically, you use nuclear decay to make a block of typically a radioactive oxide hot, and then you use that thermal gradient across a Peltier type device to generate power. And it pumps out about 250 watts, which is not even one tenth of the energy you would need to run a kettle. But what's more impressive is the transmitter on the New Horizons runs at about 12 watts barely enough energy to run a LED light bulb. And that's what's transmitting all of the data back home. And so when you actually get data back from New Horizons, it's being transmitted from a 12 watt transmitter on the edge of the solar system. And of course, because of this, it's not the fastest of data transfers. In fact, it's death slow. How death slow? About half a megabyte per hour. The sort of thing that would make dial-up modems seem blisteringly fast. So how do we get all these beautiful images back from Pluto with such a slow data transfer rate? Well, the way it worked with Pluto is as it flew by, it stored loads of data, and then it slowly transmitted it back to Earth over the period of a year or so. Now, it's actually been a couple of years since New Horizons hammered past Pluto and found it to be quite a bright object in a dark place. Like I was saying, by the time you're out as far as Pluto, the sun is a little dot in the sky, to the point where if you were to look out on Pluto, it's about 1,600 times fainter than it is here on Earth. Or to look at it another way, if you were to stand on Pluto, the sun is about 100 times brighter in the sky than the moon is here on Earth. It's about 100 times brighter than the full moon in the sky. So it would probably look more like heavy dusk terms here on Earth. Now, during the day, Pluto itself is quite a bright place, being mostly coated with nitrogen ice, which is very reflective, not unlike the ice fields here on Earth. And not at all like our moon, which is mostly grayish rock type stuff. 
In fact, the moon only reflects about one seventh of the light that hits it, whilst Pluto reflects almost half of the light that hits it. So if you would see the moon in the sky and Pluto up next to it at the same distance, it would be about half of the diameter or one quarter of the surface area, but it would be almost as bright as the full moon. It would be a very bright snowball next to a gray rock. And rocks not actually that far off. The moon is much denser than Pluto. I mean, just to put it all into perspective, the density of water is typically about one gram per cubic centimeter, while rocks are mm, two to four grams per cubic centimeter. Now, the density of ice is uh, somewhat lower than water. It's about 0.9 grams per cubic centimeter. But from this, you can see that the objects on the edge of the solar system, things like Pluto, have a density much more in line with water than they are with rocks. And it's from this region, out by the edge of the solar system, where most of our comets come from. And as they get closer to the sun, they start to shed gas and reflective particles that come out with that. And that's why the comets have tails. And that's basically what you see. Pluto is very much an ice ball with a bit of a rocky core. Whereas most of the objects out this far are not even that. They're just mostly dirty ice balls. Now, it turns out that on the edge of the solar system, it's actually pretty cold. And so these objects, which are mostly ice, don't evaporate into space because they're so cold. However, if they fall onto a cometary orbit, which brings them close to the sun, then of course, eh, water, when it gets up to a moderate temperature in a vacuum, starts to outgas. And that pulls off all the little reflective particles, which is the tail of the comet. However, the most fascinating thing about the comets is just how low their density is. I mean, remember what I was saying, ice is about 0.9 grams per cubic centimeter. Well, these things are much lower than that. They're about half the density of water. And the only way you can get density that low is if there's lots of spaces within it. It's much more like a snowball or an ice ball with lots of holes in it, lots of porosity. Now, it's long been observed that comets have weird shapes to them. You know, a lot of them look like peanuts and the such like. Leading to the interesting question, did they form like that at the beginning of the solar system? Or is that shape just what they look like after they've gone into these elliptical orbits and been cooked by the sun for a bit? Well, New Horizons has just kind of answered that. You see, it was well known for a few years before the Pluto flyby that New Horizons would be at a bit of a loose end after that. So what to do next? So loads of ground-based telescopes scoured the area ahead of the New Horizons flight path in the hope they would find something that New Horizons could take a close look at with its meager fuel supplies. Now, Fortune really favored the brave here. A New Horizons was launched in 2005 ish to fly by Pluto in about 2015. Ultima Thule, the thing that it's just flown by, was only discovered in 2014. That's almost a decade after the launch of this probe. No one on Earth actually knew that Ultima Thule was there when this spacecraft was designed and launched. However, the calculations were done and the flyby was doable. The slight downside, though, is this object was tiny. I mean, the moon's fairly small on the grand scheme of things. Pluto, smaller still. In ballpark numbers, the moon is about the size of America. Pluto would be about half the size of America. Ultima Thule is more like the size of Manhattan. Or to put it into perspective, if you were to have the moon in the sky and the Pluto next to it, and then put Ultima Thule next to that, you would need a telescope to see it. Now, this problem was exacerbated for the New Horizons probe in that Ultima Thule is actually quite a dark object, comparably dark to the moon. And of course, out here, like I was saying, there's less than a thousandth of the light that there is by Earth. So it's actually quite difficult to see these objects until you're right on top of them. And given the limitations of the spacecraft's low data transfer rate and the time lag, it was actually quite technically challenging just to point the camera in the right direction. I mean, just for perspective, this is Ultima Thule. It's about 30 kilometers long. The New Horizons probe flew by within about 3,000 kilometers of it. Give or take the moon's diameter or the size of the United States. 
I mean, it really is. It's like sitting in California and trying to actually get a decent image of something about as far away as Manhattan. And it was traveling at about 14 kilometers per second, 40 times the speed of sound, five times the speed of a railgun bullet. The phrase faster than a speeding bullet just took on a whole new meaning. So think about that, a slug that big. A slug that big going Mach 7 puts a hole through six half inch steel plates this big. Just this little slug. Went through all of these. All six of those. And oh, by the way, can shoot a projectile like this well over 100 miles at Mach 7. Seven times the speed of sound. Seven times the speed of sound. Oh, that's kind of cute, kind of quaint. The military man is impressed with seven times the speed of sound. Whereas New Horizons here has been traveling over 40 times the speed of sound and has been doing it for over a decade. Yeah, that's the sort of speed where you really want to make sure there aren't any undetected moons uh, or surprises like that. Which is another one of the reasons why they had all of these telescopes looking at Ultima Thule eh, just as a safety check. So traveling at about 50,000 kilometers per hour the flyby here would take about one hour. And how long does it take the signals from the spacecraft to get back to Earth? About five to six hours. So the combination of trying to point the spacecraft cameras at this really small, fairly dark object whose position oh, wasn't entirely certain. And, you know, due to the time lags, you've really just got to program the spacecraft up and hope for the best. Oh, and boy, did fortune favor the bold this time. What they found was a virgin contact binary. Like I was saying, these objects typically have very low density. So any modest speed collision would make a complete mess of these objects. And the mere fact that you've got these basically perfectly spherical, gently touching spheres points to a very gentle accretion near the birth of the solar system. And of course, this far out, it's cold, really cold, such that the volatile stuff like water or carbon monoxide doesn't get burnt off. And as is often the way with accretion, you can form multiple centers of gravity. Hell, something like one third of the stars that we can see are binary stars. In fact, you might even argue that our solar system is a failed binary star, with Jupiter being the second failed star. So it looks that likewise with the accretion of Ultima Thule, two centers formed that through one mechanism or another lost momentum such that the two bodies formed a gentle contact binary. So what's the actual density of Ultima Thule? Well, no one really knows for certain. I mean, you get some ballpark estimates from the fact that it's not flown apart or something. But the real problem is the gravity of an object this small is tiny. I mean, for certain, some of the comets that we've actually visited and measured the gravity of, jumping would give you escape velocity. So a common way of actually measuring the density of an object is just to fly past it and see how much your course is perturbed by the gravity of the object. That gives you the object's mass, and of course you know the object's size, therefore you know its density. But the gravity here is so low that they've not got a sensible estimate of its density but it's lightly comparable to other comets. Now, as objects get heavier, which mostly means bigger, they get more gravity, and eventually that's enough to crush this sort of fluffy, porous ice-type material into solid ice, which is about the sort of time where these objects would start to get squished into more spherical objects. It's also about the sort of time when the denser stuff, which thanks to the heat of accretion and the radioactive decay in these rocky type materials, allows these denser objects to sink to the middle of the planet, which is basically how you get things like Pluto, which have a rocky core and an icy mantle. Or with things like the Earth, you get the very dense stuff in the middle, the iron and the nickel, and then you get the less dense stuff, like the, basically the rock mantle further out, and then on the top you get the really low density stuff, like water and the atmosphere. Now, Ultima Thule is nowhere near any of this. And like I was saying, it's not that clear what the density is, but it's likely to be comically low. This is likely a barely held together dust bunny from the very beginning of this solar system. In real color, the surface of this object is more of a dark red. 
fairly similar to some of the dark patches on Pluto and Charon, which are due to organic compounds that have been roasted, albeit very, very slowly, by high energy particles from the sun and from the universe in general. This object is also almost unique in the entire solar system due to the lack of craters on an ancient surface. So this is roughly the area in our solar system from where our comets originated. Now it had been long known that comets tended to have these weird peanut type shapes and there was lots of speculation, lots of models, but no one knew for certain if that's how they actually formed or they actually formed as more spherical objects and eventually got burnt down by the sun to these more peanut type shapes. But Ultima Thule has laid that to rest in spectacular fashion. Our Earth is a hot, dynamic and turbulent place. But even some of the large colder moons like Triton have cryovolcanism. The solar system has been far from a static place since its birth, but not everywhere. This is the most virginal, pristine, most unchanged body yet discovered by man. In all likelihood, all but unchanged since the dawn of the solar system itself. It's an amazing discovery made all more impactful by the fact that even if we wanted to send another probe and we could launch it tomorrow, it would be at least another 10 years before we would get another look at such an object. And for this, I really, really tip my hat to the people who ran this project, from the design of the probe to the launch to the execution of the mission itself, such that we could see for the first time this ancient silent watcher frozen in time, right on the edge of the unknown. Yes, Ultima Thule, a more apt name couldn't have been given. A distant, unknown region, the extreme limit of travel and discovery. So if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and ring the notification bell. And if you really enjoyed it, subscribe and maybe consider supporting this channel through Patreon. 